Okay, once again, um, my name is Franz Fellun. I'm the director of the Center for Human Rights here in the Faculty of Law, University of Pretoria. If I've not met you before, I'm very glad to make your acquaintance, even if it's virtually. Uh, we wish that everyone around the table, at the conference table, the virtual table, could introduce themselves. But uh, perhaps during the course of the conference, one, once you pose a question or make a contribution, please also introduce yourself briefly and, and, and um, that would be an opportunity for us to get to know each other. So it really is my privilege um, and honor to welcome you all participants, colleagues, friends to this virtual conference, two day conference. As you know, it is about elections and COVID-19 harnessing the pandemic uh, to improve elections and particularly in the African context. Now, I think most of you would um, know that in a, in a in a normal world, in a world that is not like the one we are facing, we would have been very fortunate to receive most of you in person for a conference like this at uh, the University of Pretoria. And then you would have been able to see for yourself by looking at the jacarandas I can see here through my, through my window, why uh, Pretoria is called, or Chuani is called a uh, jacaranda city. That is the uh, downside of not being together, but the upside is that I think many of you would perhaps not have been able to join us, are now in fact able to join us, so we, we also um, acknowledge that, that fact. So welcome once again. We know that there are many contending priorities and imperatives, and uh, you um, have chosen to be with us, and we appreciate and we hope that the two days together would be very meaningful and useful to you. Now, allow me just to say a few words about the Center for Human Rights, especially for those of you who are not so well acquainted with the Center. On the one hand, the Center is um, an academic department. We are based in the Faculty of Law. We present masters and doctoral programs with formal, you know, graduate qualifications. On the other hand, we are a bit of a civil society, NGO, think tank kind of organization inside university. And uh, for that, we depend on donor funds and we try to advance human rights in the broad sense within the African context. We also try to contribute in a modest way to um, African scholarship on issues related to human rights and publications related to this uh, scholarship. In that context, the center organizes, for example, um, the African and the World Nelson Mandela mood court competitions to um, create greater awareness and understanding of, for example, the African Court on Human and People's Rights. We have a number of units that focus on a particular group's rights, and uh, we uh, try to advance scholarship in respect of those particular concerns. Now, this particular conference, then, is in a sense a bridge between the center as an academic institution and the center trying to do outreach, advocacy, capacity building around um, the continent on issues of concern. So if you look at the program, I'm sure you have, I am struck by the fact that in a sense, what we are trying to achieve here could be called um, the scholarship of optimism. Because I think the premise in a sense is that from a calamity, we will seek out the opportunity, the opportunity to reflect on uh, what had occurred through COVID, but look at it critically and trying to derive insights, not only about how we've been managing to deal with COVID, but also how perhaps we get to understand elections and issues around elections even more deeply and profoundly. So um, welcome to this uh, attempt at uh, the um, scholarship of optimism. In our program, I think there are two main focal areas. One of them would be thematic. You will see that we're looking at a number of countries where elections have actually already taken place in the context of COVID-19. And that would be, uh, for example, Malawi and Burundi. And then we look at elections that are upcoming, um, the local government elections in South Africa um, the, um, get some attention, and also the election coming up in Uganda, for example. There are others, but these will feature specifically on the program. So we, we really invite your reflections and debate on these issues in particular. The other theme, I suppose, is uh, more around substantive issues. And I think in the context of COVID, we've seen um, some issues really gaining much in um, our um, consideration and reflection. One of them is certainly access to information. We uh, see uh, you know, the importance of media as a conduit to provide information. Much reflection in this um, conference will also go onto this theme. 
The other um, substantive issue that I see highlighted in the program is also that of um, technology and linking technology both to um, access to information, but also to voter education. So I think in particular, that will be the issues that will excite us in this conference is how COVID-19 have uh, brought us uh, to understand issues in a slightly different way or focus on uh, different ways of doing things uh, differently that had been done um, in the past. Now, within the center, um, we have two units. We have two units among our 10 units. Those two units have been instrumental in putting together this uh, conference. The first unit is that of um, the unit on expression, information, and digital rights. That is headed by Klengiwe Dube. Um, Klengiwe and your team, thank you very much. I think we have had the privilege in this unit to work, for example, with the African Commission Special Rapporteur on the rights um, of freedom of expression and access to information, among others, in developing the guidelines on elections and access to information in Africa. So I'm sure that work will also resonate with our program uh, during this, uh, these two days. The other unit that had been instrumental is um, our unit on democracy and civic engagement. And that unit, among others, works on um, forging closer collaboration between civil society organizations and the Pan-African Parliament. It does other work around democracy and elections. The head of that unit is uh, Bonolo uh, Makhale. Uh, thank you very much, Bonolo, and everyone who worked with you. I also want to thank our technical team, Karuna, Sempiwe, Yolanda, who are always here, you know, if something happens, and it happens seamlessly, it's because there is a team, as we know, behind that make, and make it so. So thank you very much for all uh, your hard work and contributions in this regard. We thank, in anticipation, all the speakers, all the chairs of session, our collaborators, our friends, everyone who is here um, and will perhaps also still join us. So without any further ado then, um, I will uh, perhaps also just note that regrettably, our uh, keynote speaker, who his name appears on the program, advocate Nobi Zita Mlilo, is unable. I think Bonolo will give us more information, but there was a, a very, very uh, unfortunate last minute um, accident um, that occurred. So um, advocate Mlilo is not able to join us, but um, I think we are almost at the um, registered time for our first session. So I'm going to ask um, Bonolo, who is the moderator for our first session to uh, perhaps say one or two words about um, Advocate Nlilo's um, absence, and then to take us and introduce the speakers uh, for our first panel. Once again, from my side, just to say thank you for joining us. Um, we appreciate and we really trust that this will be um, a fruitful and meaningful and enriching um, two days for everyone involved. Thank you so much. Thank you, Prof. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, as Prof has said, my name is Bonolo Makhale, and I am a program manager of the Democracy and Civic Engagement Unit at the Center for Human Rights. I also want to echo Prof's words and thank everyone for joining us this morning, and to also thank our presenters and all the hard work that they've put in thus far. Just a few house rules before we, we continue. Please make sure that your mics are muted and your videos are turned off. And if you have questions and comments, please put them in the chat box. And once all the speakers have spoken, they will engage with your questions. Lastly, um, just note that this is being live streamed on Facebook and it will be recorded and placed on the center's website and social media. And again, unfortunately, advocate um, Lilo is unable to join us. He had an accident late um, last night, and our thoughts, our prayers are with him. I think we can all agree that the world is facing an unprecedented crisis, and undoubtedly, the multidimensional challenges brought by COVID-19 are enormous. Um, in an attempt to respond to the pandemic, we have seen over the past couple of months, countries around the world have had to take decisive actions and adopted extraordinary measures 
to preserve lives and to minimize the spread of the virus. And certainly there is a linkage between COVID-19 and elections. And evidently the pandemic has been extremely destructive to election processes. Um, we've seen states were and are forced to evaluate whether they're in a position to hold free, fair, transparent and credible elections. And many gov governments have had to postpone or revise their election preparations as a result of COVID-19. And while African states are forced to take these decisive actions to curb the spread of COVID-19, it's important that the governance of the pandemic um, does not in any way endanger constitutionalism. It does not in any way endanger the rule of law and overall the well-being of, of citizens. And therefore this means that governments are in a position that needs a, a delicate balance of preserving human rights and equally maintaining um, democratic principles. And therefore we have convened the space and this conference and we're hoping that in the next uh, two days we can collectively engage on how African states are navigating uh, political participation, navigating democracy, um, particularly democracy around elections and also navigating public health. We are hoping that we can also collectively engage on you know, the unique political and electoral situation in selected African countries and human rights and the socio-legal ramification of postponing and canceling the elections. But it, tomorrow in particular, we will specifically be looking at a feasibility of technological solution for enhanced voter participation in Africa. And we've got um, amazing and brilliant speakers um, that have committed their time and their skills and their knowledge to help us facilitate this conversation. So I'm briefly going to introduce the three speakers that are speaking in this session. We've got Ms. Nobuke Kunene. Uh, Ms. Kunene is an independent legal researcher with a keen interest in critical legal theory, uh, public decision-making, cooperative institutionalism and administrative justice. Um, she graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in Politics and International Relations in 2015, and is due to obtain her Bachelor of Laws at the end of this year at Wits University. Well done, Nobuke, um, um, obtaining your, your Bachelor of Laws end of this year, considering what a difficult year it has been for all of us. She has experience in working as a research intern at Center for Applied Legal Studies and having worked primarily in their programs of gender justice and basic services, she developed a passion for legal research, human rights, advocacy, and impact litigation. Um, Ms. Nobukle will make a presentation on um, South Africa's postponed elections the rationalization, the rationalizing the Electoral Commission's crisis decision making during the COVID-19 pandemic. We also have Ms. Uh, Tinotenda Mparuta. Uh, Ms. Tinotenda is a labor law master's candidate at the University of Johannesburg with a keen interest in commercial and public interest matters of the law. And Ms. Tinotenda will make a presentation on political parties response to COVID-19 a South African perspective. And lastly, we've got Ms. Janelle Magwanda. Um, apologies, Janelle, if I'm mispronouncing your last name. She's a researcher at Africa Criminal Justice Reform, a program at the Dula Omar Institute at the University of the Western Cape. She previously worked at the Department of Public Enterprise and the Human Science Research Council. Janelle holds a Master's of Arts a degree in international relations from the University of Pretoria. And Janelle will make a presentation on African pandemic elections, particularly looking at the case of Malawi and Burundi. And therefore, at this point, I'm going to invite Ms. Nobutle Kunene to make a presentation. All speakers will have 15 minutes to make their presentation and we'll open a space for questions. Oh, oh, oh. Um, just note in participants, if you have questions and comments, please put them in the chat box. And once all our speakers have made their presentations, they'll invite you. Nobuke, over to you. 
Thank you, Bunalo. Um, let me just try to share my presentation. Okay. So my presentation speaks about the by-elections in South Africa that were postponed by the electoral... Sorry, let me just make sure. Can everybody hear me? Yes, yes we, we can. can. Okay. Yeah, so my paper speaks yeah, yes, about... Yes, we the, can. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. My paper speaks about the postponed by-elections in South Africa. They were postponed by the Electoral Commission. Um, and they were postponed by way of a court order at the electoral court. And my paper basically just analyzes the decision making that went into making this decision. So in, an, in or around 2019, South Africa's Electoral Commission created its strategic plan 2020 to 2025. And this strategic plan establishes a new long-term vision for the commission, which it calls the vision electoral excellence. And essentially the plan is a guiding or a blueprint model um, for the, the planning of all elections that are set to take place within the stipulated period. The concept of excellence is quite interesting, especially when used in elections, because it actually comes from the business and commerce literature. And it refers to an organization's improvement capability. And essentially, the measure of excellence is determined by an institution's effectiveness. And so the strategic plan caters for this concept of excellence by providing for a system of performance management, performance measurement, sorry, that identifies specific targets that must be met within the election planning process and that must be improved upon in the next election. The plan has been divided into four strategic priorities, and um, each of these priorities are referred to as outcomes, as is seen on the screen. And each of the outcomes represents an aspect of election planning that needs to be improved upon. And on the top, you can see the impact statement of the strategic plan, which reads as strengthened democracy through free and fair elections of legislative bodies. And that essentially is the purpose of the plan and it speaks to the mandate of the Electoral Commission. So therefore it goes without saying that the very act of voting is the core element of an electoral democracy. However, um, and this is widely known, um, when you look at the statistics of previous elections, it's very clear that there's a problem when it comes to the exercise of this freedom to vote. The figures show a decline in voter turnout, and it seems that the numbers seem to be decreasing with each and every single election. And the strategic plan acknowledges this, particularly as it relates to the local government elections. The local government elections seemingly have a traditional low voter turnout, and it's just a very common fact in the local elections. The local sphere of government is the first line of engagement between government and citizens. And a traditionally low voter turnout on this level is particularly concerning, especially because it is in this sphere of government that we see the worst of the worst when it comes to proper administration and service delivery. Therefore, the issue of a declining voter turnout is it's represented in the strategic plan under outcome three. And a low voter turnout is recognized in the plan as a key risk to achieving improvement in having an informed and engaged citizens and stakeholders in the electoral, in the electoral democracy. And so in the spirit of excellence as the plan envisions, not only does the strategic plan identify the risks to the improvement of the electoral system, but it goes even further than that. And it even guides a response for mitigation against the threat of each and every identified risk. And so as we see in these slides, the risk to a decline, the risk of a declining voter turnout 
the, st the strategic plan provides that a mitigation strategy would be to intensify awareness raising campaigns, to engage with target audiences, and to promote the mandate of the commission. And again, the second risk to um, an engaged citizenship and electoral democracy would be conditions that are not conducive to running a free and fair election. And the strategy provides for this and it mitigates against this by providing that um, the, the electoral commission must collaborate with other chapter nine institutions, collaborate with government structures and, and state departments and civil society in order to create an enabling environment. And it does this for each and every one of the risks that it, it actually has identified. And so then, when faced with a national crisis such as the COVID-19 pandemic, which poses various threats to the outcomes of the Commission, the concept of excellence requires that the Commission innovate and find strategic solutions to enable it to uphold its mandates, mm -hmm. even during a crisis. Mm -hmm. When it comes to decision making during a crisis, the strategic plan provides an analytical process for quality in guiding the commission to plan against the risks. The analytical process requires analysis of the internal and external environmental factors, as we can see on the left of the table. And it also uses a SWOT analysis to determine the commission's capabilities with regards to the particular issue at hand. And so potentially when a comprehensive analysis is undertaken within the structure, um, a, a possible finding might, might uh, a, or the, the analysis might possibly produce a finding that the commission is indeed capable to pursue its mandates within an appropriately adjusted election plan. And so how the commission would then go about creating an adjustment plan or a risk adjustment plan is that it would need to, the, the plan would need to speak to each of the outcomes as seen on the left of the slide. And it would have to provide a mitigation strategy using the strength of the commission's authority and the resources allocated to it. And in March, 2020, the electoral commission was truly and actually faced with this very issue. The president had just announced that a national lockdown would be imposed over the Republic and a number of by-elections at that same time were scheduled to take place in over 20 municipal wards. Very quickly, the commission approached the electoral court on an urgent basis requesting for a postponement of the by-elections and the court granted it. The court authorized the commission to postpone over 20 by-elections and even more at a later stage when the commission asked for a further postponement of more by-elections. Because of the fact that our existing electoral legislation gives limited discretion on the power of electoral authorities to postpone a by-election and coupled with the nature of the COVID-19 virus and the pandemic, I'm inclined to be somewhat understanding of the decision of the Electoral Commission and the court to postpone the, the relevant elections. However, I think it's important to note that the decision does bear some negative consequences for the state of our democracy. So what we see on this slide are some newspaper headlines um, coming from some of the, the municipalities where elections were postponed. And I'll read some of them out. Um, from ground up on the 3rd of April, the headline reads, COVID-19, filthy toilets, no water, fighting the virus in Uppington's informal settlements. In the Zululand Observer on the 16th of June, violent protest in Mdubaduba as resident, residents call for the reinstatement of the former mayor. In the tech financials on the 19th of April, coronavirus, ANC councillors looting, food parcels for the poor. These events are current, they're occurring during the lockdown and people are living in these conditions and they likely will continue to live in conditions such as these. I think it's important to show these headlines 
in order to bring awareness to the issue of service neglect and just an overall lack of justice for local communities and zero accountability for how municipalities are being administered. There simply is no room, in my opinion, for democracy to be delayed. In fact, authorization to postpone a by-election should probably have come from the people in the affected communities or through their representatives. The electoral courts in making the decision to postpone or to authorize a postponement of the elections seems to have taken more of a pragmatic approach in making its order, but I do think that the court's jurisprudence would have been better enriched had it explored the tension that arose between the right to vote and the legislative duties of the commission and the municipal executive in the national disaster. And perhaps the court would have been in a better position to consider the issues in this way if we had an election emergency legislation of sorts, which helps, which helps our system to define roles and to deal with a system or with, with an event that is unprecedented or that is unexpected. And this is exactly what my research speaks to. Just to define what an election emergency is in general, an election emergency is something that would be occasioned by an unexpected event in a particular jurisdiction that causes a substantial disruption to a scheduled election. The benefits of having an emergency legislation in place for elections is primarily to uphold the rule of law even during crisis and to ensure that the roles of the relevant actors are clear so as not to create an issue of um, like a, a legitimacy crisis or issues of illegitimacy of an institution. Having this election emergency law in place will also allow the election body to measure and improve electoral performance under different circumstances, which would expand the range of data that would be available to electoral authorities when considering the different and innovative ways that it can implement to strengthen democracy during current and future times of crisis. So ideally, my paper proposes that the election emergency proposed three types of action that can be taken in times of crisis. And these are a postponement of an election, modification of an election, and cancellation of an election. Some of these actions are already uh, provided for under our current electoral legislation, however, in, in a limited form. For example, the Municipal Electoral Act provides that the commission may postpone an election if it requests the municipal executive or if it sends a request to the municipal executive asking that a particular by-election be postponed. However, the postponement cannot fall outside of the 90-day election timeline that is prescribed by the Municipal Structures Act. And this may have been the reason why the commission decided to approach the courts for a postponement rather than the executive body. The same electoral act, the Municipal Electoral Act, provides for a modification of an election by allowing for election timetables to be amended in order to reflect changes, and also by allowing for voting stations to be moved or changed in the case of an emergency. So it, it's interesting because the, the election legislation does mention the word emergency, but it doesn't actually define what an emergency is in an election, um, and it doesn't really say, it doesn't give many other um, ways that an emergency can be dealt with other than to change voting stations. And um, yeah, the act does not, the current electoral legislation doesn't provide for an election cancellation. My research proposes that an election postponement only be termed as such if the new date falls within the statutory limits. In this way, a postponement will only be undertaken for an emergency that has reasonably predictable scales of disruption, and the authorities would still be bound by their legislative duties, except that a postponement would just allow them more time to plan for the disruption and to put adequate measures in place. And then where the postponement falls outside of the statutory limits, this should be called what it is, 
it should be called a cancellation of that particular election. And for a cancellation to be imposed, the emergency must be shown to have a highly disruptive effect that the electoral commission that the electoral commission and the executive authorities cannot reasonably accommodate within its reasonably within its available means. And this, I propose, should be proven and not just said um, in order for it to be granted. An election modification then would be applicable in either a postponement or a cancellation and should provide extensive measures that can be taken according to what type of emergency the electoral system is facing at that time um, in order to contain the threat or to mitigate against the risk of that emergency. And then when it comes to the roles of the relevant stakeholders in an election emergency legal system, um, the roles will largely depend on or will largely rely on cooperation between all the relevant public bodies. The institutions with the most responsibility would, of course, be the voting body, which in this case would be the Municipal Executive Council and the Electoral Commission. The executive, as the voting body, must be the ones to decide whether the election is postponed, modified, or cancelled, and then communicate that decision with the commission, who must then begin the appropriate planning process in line with their mandate. I then propose that the commission, together with the executive, form an election emergency sub-council or committee of sorts that will operate within the voting district. And the subcommittee would um, be staffed with experts, people that are experts in, for example, that particular emergency or disaster. For example, in the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic, that would be someone with extensive experience in communicable diseases or someone who knows how to prevent um, the spread of these diseases in a situation where you have an election, for example. And the subcommittee would essentially be tasked with implementing the mandates that it receives from the executive and would also have to ensure that adequate measures are taken in order to assist the commission to execute its mandates. Now, this approach is not necessarily unheard of. Um, in fact, in the build up to South Africa's first democratic election in 1994, the country saw threats to the success of a national, a democratic national election. And this led to the promulgation of the Transitional Executive Act, which created the transitional, or which authorized the creation of the Transitional Executive Council, which had the authority to staff and mandate a sub council, which could take appropriate action in high risk areas to deal with any threats to a free and fair democratic election. The Poputatswana homeland, which is now a part of um, the Northwest province, was under the leadership, of, the leadership of Lucas Mangobe at the time, who had banned residents from, of the homeland from participating in the South African election. And this was despite protests and demonstrations from the residents of the homeland, of them wanting Bukutatswana to be a part of South Africa and of them wanting to participate in the election. And so, of course, this became a crisis for the election commission and for the election authorities in the states of South Africa. The head of the election commission Electoral Commission at the time, Justice Grechla, met with the leader, Mangobe, and attempted to get his cooperation to allow the residents to participate freely in the South African election. Failing this attempt, the Commission advised the Transitional Executive Council on the leader's refusal to cooperate, and with the support of the South African military force, the violence that had culminated in the region was contained. The council, together with the South African government, was able to remove Mangobe from office and the residents of Bukutatswana, who had demonstrated and demanded reincorporation into South Africa, were able to vote freely in the democratic election. Now, the structure of the Transitional Executive Act, I think, is a useful one, and it was useful at the time because it granted extensive powers to members of the council but within a structured framework that limited the exercise of those powers for the purpose of the act. 
And I think this made it easier for courts to play their role and to review any decisions that were taken in terms of that law where you know, the courts had any matters of that sort before it. And so using this structure or a similar structure for an election emergency today, I think would empower citizens, especially in municipalities where by-elections are or could possibly be postponed by way of a court order, which I don't think is um, a desirable act. I think it's also important to consider um, the results of elections that have already taken place elsewhere during times of crisis. And one such example, I think, is Liberia during the 2014 Senate election, when, which occurred during the, the Ebola crisis. The election was postponed twice because of the Ebola crisis, but it could not be postponed any further than the 20th of December which was then, okay, it couldn't be just, um, postponed any further than the 20th because the 20th was the term that the incumbent government would, the term of the incumbent government would come to an end on the 20th of December. And so postponing it beyond this date would create a constitutional crisis of sorts. And so, and a group of interested parties approached the Supreme Court of Liberia and asked for the, for the court to authorize a further postponement of the election because of the Ebola virus, and the court declined. The court stated that it was not the place of the court to decide whether the election should be postponed or whether it should take place. And so following this, the Liberian Elections Commission continued to plan for the election, and it had the appropriate security measures in place to try and prevent against the spread of the virus. When the Liberian Elections Commission was criticized for going forth with the election, the commission cited a joint resolution that had been agreed upon by state election stakeholders before the Ebola crisis. And the joint, the joint resolution essentially stated that the Senate election would not be held any later than the 20th of December, 2014. And so the Elections Commission was bound by that and it decided to commit itself to performing on its mandate on the basis of that joint resolution. So data collected from the International Growth Center from the elections show that even though elections took place during the Ebola crisis, there was an increase of 2.7% in voter turnout. And this growth was experienced mainly in geographical locations where there was um, where there were outbreaks of the of the Ebola virus, and then also the the statistics showed that political perceptions remained largely unchanged, and the result of the election was itself not drastically different from previous elections. So the leadership remained largely the same, even though there were reports of corruption and misallocation of aid during the time. And the study also provides that the possible reason for a lack of change in leadership um, from that election was because there weren't any active accountability structures that were in place that could adequately inform the electorate on who was a part of the corrupt schemes and who was an incompetent leader. And so they were not able to adequately vote with that knowledge in mind because they didn't have that knowledge. But essentially, the, like, the Liberian government response, I would say, is quite useful. Um, and I think it could be an example for our electoral commission because it shows that a purpose-driven approach to an election threat could possibly yield improved outcomes, particularly on the issue of um, a declining voter turnout. And so what I would propose, just in conclusion, um, given that the strategic plan of the Electoral Commission speaks about electoral excellence, I would say that this concept of excellence actually requires that the Electoral Commission have an unwavering commitment to its constitutional mandate. And so essentially, even in a crisis, the Commission needs to apply a comprehensive and strategic approach to crisis election management with a strict view of promoting electoral democracy where reasonably possible. And then secondly, 
I would recommend that the Commission reflect moving forward on its response during the 2020 by-election period and to seriously engage the public and stakeholders on defining a crisis election framework that would help to improve the electoral, res the electoral response for the next crisis. And then lastly, I would recommend that the Commission propose um, that election stakeholders actually come together and form some sort of a resolution to come up with a system that would allow for inefficiencies to be detected and for corruption to be, um, for people who are corrupt to be held accountable in a system. And then lastly, I just want to end with a quote from the Electoral Commission chairperson. And he was giving a statement on, on the measures that would take place um, to facilitate all the postponed by-elections. And the elections are all set to take place next week sometime, I think on the 11th of November, and they're all gonna take place simultaneously in order to make up the backlog that the postponement had caused. And what he said in that statement was, or part of what he said was, now that circumstances have improved, we are ready to give voters their political voice back. And I think the statement is part of the problem because I don't think it should be possible for an electoral commission to give and take back the political voice of the electorate. Um, I definitely think that something more needs to be done, structures needs to be put in place, and hopefully we can react better in the next, in the next emergency. Hopefully we can put measures in place to fix what has happened and to have an improved electoral system for next time. Thank you. Thank you, Nobuche. I greatly appreciate your extensive presentation. Um, one of the things that you noted, which I thought was important, was highlighting the, the voter turnout issue, which not only um, do we see it in local government elections in particular, uh, but we saw it even in the 2019 um, national elections when our voter turnout was incredibly low, according to the um, international standard, but also I like how you highlighted potential avenues to explore and strengthen um, democracy um, during COVID-19 pandemic and further, um, you know, encourage um, the commissions to figure out ways in which they could explore um, various and creative um, ways of strengthening um, democracy um, in, in, in moments of crisis or if there's any other pandemic. And the examples that you made, you made were quite useful, particularly in your reflection of Liberia and um, Liberia and, and, and the Ebola crisis. And so now I'm going to call on uh, Ms. Tinotenda. And as I noted earlier, Tinotenda will be giving her presentation on political parties' response to COVID-19. And Tinotenda will focus specifically on um, the three main political parties in South Africa, um, her paper specifically within the South African context. She should look at how the African National Congress, which is the leading party in, in South Africa, have responded to COVID-19, and the two opposition parties, the Democratic Alliance and, and the EFF. Um, so I'm gonna hand over to you, Tinotenda. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Mahale. Can everyone hear me? Hello? Yes, 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 yes. I can hear you. All right, I'm about to share my screen right now. Can everyone see my screen? Hello? Yes. All right. Yeah. Um, I will not be making a video because my network bandwidth is very weak. 
so I won't put any more strain on it. As Ms. Mahale said, uh, my name is Tina Chenda Mparuta, and um, I'll start off by looking into the history of, by providing a brief history of politics in South Africa. The history of South African continent um, is pertinent to this discussion as local government sources, which okay. ushered the Sorry, I don't know. An oppressive oh, apartheid, oh, Afrikaans oh, language oh, policy, oh, trade union activism, and the. Hello? Sorry, Chinatenda, your, your line okay. is on the air. Um, I don't know. Oh, you can't hear me. Okay, now we can. It's a little clearer now. Okay. Um, let me try again. Yes, go for it. All right. Um, okay. In the consequent weeks, thousands of marginalized South Africans from townships across the country took to the streets in camaraderie against the apartheid state. The National Party, which was the governing party at the time, was able to retain a veneer of stability through the use of force and numerous young South Africans fled the country and joined the Pan-African Congress or the ANC to fight against apartheid. These happenings and internal revolt within the governing National Party were the zenith that led to a compromise which saw Nelson Mandela being released from prison in 1990 and elected as president of the Republic of South Africa in 1994. Presently, South Africa is a parliamentary representative democratic republic. Its public sector is an area within which politics are practiced to their full potential. The ruling party commands the land and determines priorities. Hence, the ANC is a policy and oversees the, ex the executive, function, executive action of the Republic of South Africa. The appointed officials at God, the relationship between the ruling party and the electorate is a critical factor in determining sure effective government. Uh, the constitution was, was formed. The constitution establishes the framework for, election, for elections in South Africa. It came into effect on 4 February 1997 and provides You know, Tenda, we're still struggling to hear you. Tenda. Tino Tenda. Hello. Hi there. We really are struggling to hear you. Um, may I suggest that for now we move on to Janelle while we privately try to sort out your, your internet. Um, we've not been able to hear um, half of your presentation so far. Tinotan, are you there? Okay, so I'm going to, Janelle, I'm going to hand over to you um, for now, and then we'll figure out a way to um, have Tinotenda come back after your presentation, if that's okay with Hello. you. Yes, I heard what you said. You may move on. All right. Okay, that's fine. Thank you, Bonolo. I will then share my screen. Good 
afternoon, uh, or good morning rather, to all the colleagues online. As Bonolo indicated, my name is Janelma Mangwanda, and my presentation this morning will be on African pandemic elections, study of Malawi and Burundi. My presentation will follow this outline, uh, a brief introduction, and then I will look into the case of Malawi, focusing on how the government responded to the coronavirus pandemic and the 2020 election during a pandemic, as well as the voter turnout and free elections. And the same format will be followed for the Burundi election case. And I will close with a conclusion. As a way of introduction, as we all know by now, on the 11th of March, the World Health Organization declared the coronavirus a worldwide pandemic. And at the time, uh, commentary regarding uh, concerns of the, the effects, the potential effects that this pandemic would have on the world began to rise. And particularly in Africa, there were a lot of uh, commentators speculating of how um, um, Africa would not be able to handle the effects of uh, the pandemic. In fact, initially there were myths that the virus would not even spread on the continent because of the hot and humid climate. However, uh, these myths were quickly debunked as cases on the continent began to rise. So some of the concerns and the commentary regarding um, the virus in Africa was particularly in terms of the continent's inability to deal with the pandemic given the lack of adequate infrastructure, as well as the socioeconomic realities in many African countries. There were also concerns regarding the very under-resourced health systems across the continent, which are already under severe strain due to other diseases such as malaria, HIV and AIDS and, um, and malaria. However, surprisingly, um, Africa appears to have fared significantly better than other countries in the world or in other continents on the world in terms of a very low mortality and high recovery rate. Uh, scientists have, um, have begun to discuss um, reasons as to why the cases in Africa have been so low. And some research have shown that, well, um, African countries perhaps were quick to impose lockdowns and curfews, which helped to uh, prevent the spread of the virus. And others have spoken about the fact that Africa is um, known to have a very young population, which could have also had an effect into the very low mortality. But as we have discussed earlier on, there have been consequences that the pandemic has brought. And one of them, of course, has been the interruption of pre-planned activities such as elections. According to the Electoral Institute for Sustainable Development in Africa, a total of 21 elections were scheduled to take place, of which only nine have taken place. And according to the Institute of Democracy and Electoral Assistance, at least 71 territories across the world have either delayed or canceled elections and votes for various reasons due to the pandemic. And of course, there are consequences of a delayed or canceled election. Uh, these include obviously a breach of citizens' right to remove or renew the mandates of incumbent governments through their vote the rising costs of holding elections after a delay, as well as fears that uh, governments will not promptly set new dates after the delay, which of course will lead to some leaders uh, consolidating power and the grip on. Interestingly, in the United States, which is currently um, voting on uh, today, uh, tonight, um, President Trump suggested that elections, which have never in history been delayed in the U.S., to allow people to vote properly, securely, and safely. Um, the president at the time cast doubts on the option of using mail-in voting due to fears of fraud and foreign interference. Uh, we know from the case in the U.S. that um, the Constitution does not allow um, the vote to be delayed, and um, that therefore um, there was no way that the elections could have been delayed. But the context in Africa, and I want us to speak about Africa because my focus is on two African countries, 
the context in Africa is quite different. Um, Africa has a context of decolonizations in the 60s and 70s, as we know, and obviously the efforts of uh, democratizations, which came through in the 90s and the 80s, have brought about a very interesting. While elections on the continent have facilitated democratization, progress has not been even in all African countries. As we know, most of the challenges or some of the challenges of electoral democracy on the continent include violent electoral contestations, credibility issues, issues in terms of organizing um, and administrating elections, as well as autocratic tendencies and refusals to vacate power. Former president of the Republic of Congo once said that one does not organize elections to end up on the losing side. Therefore, while holding elections may be considered a milestone, it is not automatically an uh, indication of Africa's legitimacy of, um, uh, is not an indication of Africa's democratic legitimacy. Therefore, in some cases, electoral contests are oftentimes window dressing exercises aimed at legitimizing the status quo. Interestingly, the coronavirus has presented new challenges and many countries that continued with elections around the world put in very uh, interesting mitigating measures uh, in order to continue and proceed with their elections. In Israel, for example, voting was done at separate tented off polling locations. In the front municipal elections, proxy voting was permitted in Guinea, in their parliamentary elections, the use of radio stations reminding voters to keep a distance was used. And in Australia, officials made use of disposable colored earbuds to dab ink on voters' fingers instead of allowing them to dip their fingers in the shared ink. These are just some of the measures that some countries have placed during elections during a pandemic. But let us now go into the case of Malawi. Malawi's presidential election took place on the 23rd of June, 2020. In February, 2020, the Constitutional Court had annulled the 2019 elections due to massive fraud and widespread irregularities, most particularly because of the use of TIPEX, which is a correctional fluid, which was used to tamper with voting ballots. The court, the Constitutional Court, had ordered a rerun of the elections within 150 days, which was a very historical moment uh, in the country's history because this had never been done before. In fact, on the continent, the very first time it was done was in Kenya in 2017, where a rerun was also ordered. But now, one of the biggest changes or the differences between the 2019 election in Malawi and the 2020 was that there was now an adoption of a 50 plus one majority system, which meant that instead of the candidate with the most votes winning, the victor now needed to ensure that they had absolute majority, which made alliances crucial. But in order to understand the electronic, uh, the electoral um, results in Malawi and in Burundi as well, we first have to understand how the government responded to the pandemic, because this will have an impact on how the elections took place. In Malawi, on the 20th of March, about a week before the first uh, case was announced, President Mutarika at the time declared a state of disaster in order to prevent the possible transmission of the virus. Shortly afterwards, the virus was declared a formidable disease. And on the 14th of April, a 21 day lockdown was announced. This lockdown was to be in effect from the 18th of April to the 9th of May. And this lockdown would have entailed the closure of all non-essential businesses and services. On the electoral front, the proposed lockdown was perceived by opposition parties as a ploy by the president to delay the rerun elections in order to remain in power for as long as possible. However, a court order blocked the intended lockdown after a coalition of civil society organizations challenged the government on account that it had not put adequate socioeconomic measures in place to cushion the impact that such a lockdown would have on the poor and marginalized, and also because the government had not consulted with civil society regarding the intended lockdown. 
In fact, the ban on gatherings that was first announced on the 20th of March meant that no political parties were allowed to hold campaign rallies. However, electoral campaigning saw mass rallies taking place by all parties, much to the consternation of health experts. Concerns were raised regarding the lack of social distancing at polling rallies and the fact that in most cases, very few attendees wore face masks at campaign rallies. Claims were even made by one opposition leader that the disease could not be contracted through physical contact, and he therefore encouraged supporters to hug fellow compatriots because they are your relations. This reveals that for the most part, rally attendees ignored COVID-19 health measures. But when we look at the voter turnout in Malawi, we find that on election day, Malawi had an accumulative 803 reported cases and 11 deaths. When we compare the 2019 elections, there were 74% voter turnout in comparison to this year's elections, whereby 65% of registered voters cast their vote. This is a difference of 9%. And it's very interesting because according to the rules in Malawi, only those registered to vote in last year's general election were eligible to vote in this rerun. While there are many reasons to explain the difference, there is reason to believe that a combination of the fear of contracting the virus due to perhaps uncontrolled masses on voting day, long queues, and perceived poor sanitary practices might have impacted voters' decisions to stay home and not exercise their right to vote. However, we need to also bear in mind that a case can be made for groups of those who are immunocompromised, voters who may have stayed clear of the stations, voting stations, in order to avoid further jeopardizing their health. Another important group are prisoners who have the right to vote in Malawi. Although they may have had the opportunity to vote in this rerun election, many might not have come out in numbers if the appropriate sanitary conditions were not guaranteed at the voting polls across correctional centers. But it's very interesting and we need to consider also that since the intended lockdown was rejected by the Malawi High Court, this means that Malawi citizens had continued living their regular lives, i.e. going to work, going to the market, living their ordinary lives despite the presence of the virus. And in any of these activities, these citizens could have equally been exposed to the virus. So why would registered voters not comply with their civic duties, especially given the historic nature of this election and the fact that they had an opportunity to impact the trajectory of their country for the next five years and beyond? As far as mitigating measures are concerned, we are gloves, water, and hand sanitizers and hand washing facilities at all polling stations. The Commission also advised voters to avoid having to share the pen. Furthermore, a two meter distance between queuing voters was established. However, there are some reports that suggest that the, there were significant challenges in respecting social distancing at polls across the country and very few voters came wearing masks. Now, in terms of a free and fair elections, President Lazarus Chakwera was elected leader of Malawi with 58.57% of the vote. However, due to the COVID-19 uh, regulations, no international observer missions participated in the elections, although letters of invitation were sent. In that case, embassies and international organizations that had a presence in the country were accredited as observers. A national election observers from about 20 different local stakeholders, as well as civil society organizations, faith-based and human rights organizations participated as observers. The Malawi elections were declared free and fair by those who observed. This is just an image of the election day, and this is the actual president who uh, went out to vote. But let us then move to Burundi. Burundi is a very interesting case. It held its, its, its general election on the 20th of May, which was also right in the middle of the pandemic. 
In Burundi, the situation is very interesting because the country is dominated by three ethnic groups, the Hutu, the Tutsi, and the Twa. The country has experienced political turmoil since independence in 1961. The 2020 elections came in the wake of turbulence following the country's last election in 2015, whereby the ruling party nominated President Kurunzinza as the party's presidential nominee, which effectively guaranteed his third term as president. As a result of this announcement, in May 2015, an attempted coup by the army general was made, citing that Nkurunziza's re-election bid as, was a violation of the country's constitution. While the coup was thwarted, a reported a thousand citizens lost their lives during those two days, while many others fled to neighboring countries as a result. In 2018, Kurunzinza announced that he would not stand to run for his party's 2020 elections. Instead, Varisinda Yishimye, a former member of the army and a close ally of Kurunzinza, was the party's candidate for the 2020 election. It was announced that upon retirement, Kurunzinza would receive the title of Supreme Guide of Patriotism, together with very impressive retirement benefits. But let us then consider the government's response to the pandemic. Burundi's government's initial response to the pandemic was to put in place a series of preventative measures, including quarantine sites, screening tests, and the closure of borders in order to contain the spread of the disease. However, unlike other countries in the region that had enacted emergency powers through the establishment of states of emergencies or states of disasters or public health emergencies, Burundi did not. Neither did the government impose a lockdown or a curfew. The latter would not have been much of a surprise to citizens who were accustomed to a midnight to dusk curfew for 12 years during the civil war. In the lead up to the elections, the Burundi government accused the World Health Organization of unacceptable interferences in its management of the virus and expelled its representative as well as other experts coordinating the country's response, which had raised concerns regarding the government's disregard of measures to protect citizens. The government downplayed the impact of the pandemic, choosing instead to rely on national exceptionalism with rhetoric such as, Burundi is an exception because it is a country that has put God first, or that the country will be spared because of its Christian faith were often made by President Nkurunzinza. And it's important for us to note that while the president is permitted to hold on to his in God and healing, this should not by any means prevent the government from issuing warnings and concerns regarding the potential dangers of the virus to its citizens. Reports by Human Rights Watch indicated that the government failed to communicate fact-based information on the virus to the public. And several election rallies were hosted by both the ruling party and opposition parties in the lead up to the elections. It is reported that at some of them, thousands of people attended with no adequate social distancing measures. In terms of voter turnout, on election day, Burundi had recorded 42 coronavirus cases and only one death. However, it's important to point out that until then only 60 uh, 633 tests had been carried out. The voter turnout of the election was 87.71% compared to 73.44% during the 2015 election. And unless this is a somewhat contrived number, this suggests that either the voters were unfazed by the coronavirus pandemic, having been assured that their country was protected by God, or they were simply just very committed to exercising their voting right. In terms of the elections being free and fair, the, the, the nominee by the ruling party, Evaris Ndaishimye, won with 68.70% of the vote, which meant that there was no runoff elections uh, to be held. The Burundi government uh, barred elect, um, external observers including both international and African Union observers in view of curbing the spread of the virus and accusing the latter of being too close to the opposition. It's very interesting at this point to note that 
both countries, in fact, they had a lot of um, um, situations where they would say one thing and do the other. Um, in, in the case of Burundi, only East African community observers were allowed to come in on condition that they quarantine for 14 days. In addition to restricting the presence of international observers, independent journalists were also restricted from covering the electoral campaign. The Burundi Human Rights Initiative reported a number of irregularities, including the arrest and detention of opposition party members, as well as multiple voting by ruling party members. Unfortunately, on the 8th of June, simply three weeks after the election, the former president in Kurunzinza unexpectedly passed on. While the government had announced that the leader had suffered a cardiac arrest, unconfirmed sources believe that he had in actual fact succumbed to the virus as two weeks prior to his death, his wife had been airlifted to Kenya for treatment against the coronavirus disease. This is an image of voting day um, in Burundi. In conclusion, it is clear that the coronavirus pandemic has changed the dynamics concerning exercising the right to vote. The case study in Malawi and Burundi are good examples of countries in Africa that decided to proceed with elections despite the pandemic with varying outcomes. And while the two countries' responses to the pandemic differed, at varying points, there were clear inconsistencies between what the government said and what they did. But in any case, lessons can be learned regarding measures that should be put in place to protect voters while ensuring that free and fair elections take place. Measures include adjusting voter registration rules and polling station procedures, as well as encouraging early voting and allowing votes by mail, proxy voting or other remote voting procedures where the integrity of the vote can still be ensured. However, in the African case, um, some, some of these measures, such as voting by mail or proxy voting or other remote voting procedures are not always possible in countries in Africa due to the, 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 the challenges on the continent. But in order to take advantage of new solutions in respect of voting, it is crucial that there is an enabling environment vis-a-vis -vis the political, the legal, as well as social economic environment. And this therefore raises important questions about the future of elections in Africa, and more particularly in terms of elections during extraordinary circumstances such as pandemics. So this raises questions about whether African countries are ready to enable their citizens to vote at a time of a pandemic and to ensure that such elections are free and fair and that every vote is counted correctly. Some questions we need to ask ourselves is what should be done differently going forward? And also what tools and guidelines need to be put in place to improve elections. And also importantly, for some marginalized groups like the immunocompromised who may not have gone out during the elections to vote, what should be done for these particular groups of people? Thank you very much. Thank you, Janelle. Um, I think an interesting point to note here is in particular the case of, of Malawi and how, sorry, I'm just starting my video. Um, the case of Malawi in particular, how um, civil society organizations, citizens and opposition parties um, showed very strong resistance because there was a suspicion that the then president of Malawi was using um, coronavirus or the COVID-19 pandemic to delay elections and, 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 and subsequently stay in power. And I think what, what interests me the most uh, from your presentation is, is the power of civil society and the power of citizens and the resistance thereof where they allowed themselves to shape the political trajectory of, of their country. Of course, um, there were risks involved because um, um, of cases of COVID-19 that were, that were reported. And for Burundi in particular, what, what stood out for me was 
um, the fact that the, 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 there were a bit of, there were few inconsistencies around the way the state dealt with um, management of COVID-19. You noted that in the lead up to the elections, the, the Burundi government accused the World Health Organization of unacceptable interference in its management of the virus and subsequently expelled its um, representatives in, 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 in matters concerning um, the protection of citizens and the management of coronavirus. So it brings back to what uh, former president of South Africa, Thabo Mbeki, always spoke about that allow Africa to fix Africa's, Africa's problems. But we see the inconsistencies that on the one hand, the, the, the Burundi government was saying, um, you know, let's not allow the worst to interfere in how we manage the crisis. But on the other hand, the inconsistency there was that um, they, uh, journalists, for example, weren't allowed to report um, on um, how the elections were going and access was granted to um, East African observers, for an example. So I think that these two, these two cases make an interesting case. And just to think about it, um, Janelle, you, you noted this in your presentation. And I think Burundi was perceived as a, as a bad um, case study, considering the, the fact that it, it appeared as though there wasn't a proper attention given to the threat, the public health threat that was posed by, by the virus. So I'm trying to figure out um, what lessons can we draw, particularly from the Burundi experience regarding measures that should be put in place to protect um, the lives of voters and citizens, but equally ensuring that um, we don't tamper with, um, you know, human rights and, and, and democratic principles. Um, thank you for that presentation. I think it was, it was quite good. I'm going to hand over to Tino Tenda to give her presentation. We figure out, um, a solution. So um, my colleague Mary Stella will share her presentation on the screen and Tino Tenda will be called in um, to, to do her presentation. Are you ready for that Tino Tenda? Yes, I am. Okay, you go for it. All right, thank you. Um, so sorry for the delay. Um, I'll begin my presentation. Um, Ms. Me, if you could go to the slide about the constitution. Thank you. I'll begin my presentation with discussing the history of politics in South Africa. The history of South African politics is pertinent to this discussion as local governance was central to the negotiation process which ushered the country out of an oppressive apartheid government. Roughly 40 years ago, an enmity against local government, the enforcement of Afrikaans language policy, trade union activism, and the rise of the black consciousness movement culminated into this into the Soweto uprising. In the consequent weeks, thousands of marginalized South Africans from townships across the country took to the streets in camaraderie against the apartheid state. The National Party, which was the governing party at the time, was able to retain a veneer of stability through the use of force and numerous young South Africans fled the country and joined the Pan-African Congress or the ANC to fight apartheid. These happenings and in turn were the zenith that led to a compromise which saw Nelson Mandela being released from prison in 1990 and elected as president of the Republic of South Africa in 1994. Presently, the South Africa, presently South Africa is a parliamentary representative is a parliamentary representative democracy. Politics are practiced to their full potential. The ruling party commands the land and determines priorities. Hence, the ANC is a policymaker. The ANC government is a policymaker and oversees the executive actions of the Republic of South Africa. The appointed officials act as representatives who carry out the policies and advise the political structures. In this regard. The relationship between the ruling, really, in, in this regard, it is clear that a relationship between the political parties and the electorate is a critical factor in determining the success of a policy. For without it, the departmental functions may be greatly impaired. This, the onus is on voters to regularly examine the interface of the of, of any party to ensure effective governance. The Constitution of South Africa establishes the framework for elections in South Africa. 
It came into effect on 4 February 1997 and provides for universal adult suffrage and national common voters' role, regular elections, and the multi party system of democratic government. The founding provisions in Section 1 of the Constitution stipulate that the Republic was founded on the following values human dignity, the achievement of equality, and the advancement of human rights and freedoms. It also includes a national common voters' role regular elections, and a multi-party system of democratic government to ensure accountability, responsiveness, and openness. Section three of the constitution provides that there's a common South African citizenship and that all citizens are equally entitled to the rights, privileges, and benefits of citizenship. One of the rights in this regard is that all South Africans are entitled to the right to vote. The constitution seeks to give effect to the values to the state values that are enshrined in the founding provisions or in, in its founding provisions through the Bill of Rights. In chapter two of the constitution, which is contained in chapter two of the constitution, the rights which are, direct, which are in the Bill of Rights, which are directly relevant to elections are section seven of the constitution, which provides that the Bill of Rights is a, is a cornerstone of democracy in South Africa. It, shine, it enshrines the rights of all people in our country and affirms the democratic values of human dignity, equality, and freedom. Section 9 of the Constitution provides that everyone is equal before the law and has the right to equal protection and benefit of the law. Famili familiarity with the constitutional aspect of the electoral procedures is important in the discussion of the local government elections, as as everyone under the South African who, who um, as everyone to which the South African Constitution applies to, um, experiences um, universal suffrage. Suffrage. The local government uh, elections in South Africa have been held. Uh, South Africa five local government elections to date. The following the 2016 local government elections, the leading party was the African National Congress Party, was the African National Congress Party with 53.91% of the votes, which is a fall from the 62.93%. Sorry, Ms. Mew. May you please go to the next slide? Ms. Mew, thank you. Um, the next slide, yes, thank you. Following the 2016 local government elections, the leading party, the previous slide, please. Um, Tinotenda, we're struggling to hear you again. Ms. Me, may I please refer to the slide that has the three political parties? Oh my. Can you hear me now? We really are struggling to hear you. So I'm wondering. Can you hear me now? Um, Tino Tenda. Hello. Hi. We really are struggling to hear you. So I'm wondering if perhaps we um, can share your presentation yes. with the participants and maybe try the QA questions. I can I can ask you a few specific questions to your presentation. Uh, your line is really really bad and unstable. Okay, that's fine. I'll also type out my presentation oh, and then maybe you could upload that. that. Um, Can you hear me? Yeah, so now it sounds a little better. Can we give it a try for another two minutes or so and, and take it from there? All right. Um, following the... 2016 local government elections, the leading party was the national was the African National Congress with 53.91% uh, percent of the votes, a fall from the 
62.9. Okay, Superintendent, I'm so sorry to do this to you. We really are struggling to hear you. In 2011. In second place was the Democratic Alliance Party with 26.90% of the votes and upwards of and upwards from the 24.1% percent percent of votes um Tino Tenda. Okay, um, I'll just type out the presentation and if anyone wants it, I'll give it to them. And yes, you may just post the slides and then I'll answer any questions. Okay, sorry about, sorry about that. Um, but thank you. Um, just excuse me, I just lost my screen. Can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. So, so just before we go to questions uh, from the participants, um, Nobutle, essentially you argued that the, the commission's blanket resistance to hosting elections during uh, national lockdown was limited in scope and, and resulted in an increased risk for vulnerable communities to continue to be underserved by, by the government, if you may, and, and thus creating a risk for negative perceptions about electoral fairness. So I'm just wondering if you can come in here that wouldn't you say that at that point, the commission's priority was to, to preserve lives and, and minimize the possibility of the virus spreading. Um, and this was an attempt to manage public disaster and global crisis and not necessarily an attempt to deny the electorate of their, their constitutional right to vote. Yeah, um, you know, I would agree with that, but I think because the strategic plan speaks about this idea of excellence, I think to be an excellent institution, you have to make certain sacrifices. And that means strictly being held to your mandate. If the mandate is to strengthen democracy, through providing regular free and fair elections, and every decision that you make needs to strengthen that, ma that, that particular mandate. And I think that presents a challenge for the Electoral Commission because they're working, or the effectiveness of the Electoral Commission depends on the effectiveness of other state bodies. And I think that's the main challenge because if other state bodies, for example, if the Department of Health is not doing everything that it can to ensure that um, proper health measures are in place. If um, the National Command Council that deals with the crisis is not putting the adequate measures in place, then it becomes difficult for the commission to actually act strictly in terms of its mandate. Um, so yeah, all institutions in the state need to act effectively and within this vision of excellence for the whole entire system to work. But I do think it's important um, if the electoral system wants to keep improving to try at the very least to keep instilling its mandate in its decisions, no matter the risk, because the risk is not only the responsibility of the electoral commission, it's the responsibility of the state. The responsibility of the commission is to ensure that people come out to vote. And I think that's why the Liberian example was important because you saw even during the Ebola crisis, there was a 2.7 increase in voter turnout. And it doesn't sound like a lot, but I think it is, it is an increase or a, a notable increase. Yeah. Um, so Tinotenda, I had a question for you and this question is based on the title of your presentation in particular. And I'm hoping that you, you'd be able to answer it for us. Um, so, so, so before, before COVID-19, we see that South Africa was faced with a, a serious legitimacy crisis that um, culminated in the universal calls for constitutional amendment, for an example, um, the central ideas behind uh, you know, the rainbow nation were being pushed to the brink by both the right and left wing political parties, challenging many ideas that were put forward um, by, the, by the ANC. And, 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 and this had been, um, you know, 
how the, the game of politics was played around the ANC as the leading party and, and ways in which it engages with the state or rather with its citizens and how the citizens would engage with the state, but also how the ANC in particular was engaging with opposition parties. But an interesting thing happened um, in March um, under the pandemic, just that th those few weeks or rather the few days, even when the president made an announcement um, that the country will go on the first 21 day lockdown. We saw uh, partisanship being put on ice. There was a, a, a strong sense of solidarity and unity, particularly among, among opposition parties. Um, uh, we saw Cyril Ramaphosa, President Cyril Ramaphosa's harshest critiques had rallied on his side, um, calling on the state to support his interventions while occasionally um, um, applauding the, the president's um, decisive response to, to COVID-19. Of course, that was short-lived, you know? Um, and, and so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you had been able to engage on this, that um, if we think about the 2021 local government elections and that, that short-lived moment where for a moment, political parties were saying, as a nation, we are confronted with a crisis, um, or even globally, we are confronted with a crisis, and therefore we are going to relinquish uh, particular political ideologies and, and agendas and, and, and stand in solidarity and create a sense of unity among ourselves um, as an attempt to preserve the lives of our citizens. So I'm wondering if you had been able to, to think about what that moment may have meant for the future of South African politics and in particular the future of political parties in South Africa with a strong emphasis again on the, 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 the two main opposition parties, the DA and the EFF because um, weeks later we saw a few critics coming from the DA desk. I mean, the EFF desk, we saw um, the DA as well submitting some court orders, challenging some of the provisions that came from the cooperative governance in terms of the management of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic. Tino Tenda. Um, I agree with you and I, I agree with you and I did, um, I think I did mention such an analysis um, in my paper. Um, in my view, it's the main Position parties have been so are so used to um, opposing. <laughs> Every day they're opposing, and for the first time we saw them actually support the ruling um, party. And I think it's sad that it came to a pandemic for opposition parties to show us that they can actually understand what the ruling party is trying to do and work together. Policy amendments, how can contribute to what the ruling party is saying and help build a better life for all people in South Africa? Because at the end of the day, it, um, most, <laughs> most ruling parties, um, the ruling parties in South Africa are always quick to oppose and very slow in providing like policy measures that actually bring about a change in South Africa that would actually move the majority perhaps from the ANC into the hands of either the we not only for campaigning for elections, but after they win elections. And I think that would actually help them secure more votes in the future. Thank you. Um, I have a question here for Janelle. Um, so the question says, what is the political and legal place of international and regional electoral observers? And what is the impact on democratic elections? And I think this, is, this comes after the, the comment you made around um, Burundi not allowing international observers 
and yet allowing East African observers. Um, and it says here as well, has coronavirus played any role on impact of international observer mission in recent elections? And I, I suppose you may have highlighted this in the case of Malawi because um, international observers could not fly to Malawi though an invitation was sent to them. But yeah, speak to the, the political and legal place of international and regional electoral observers and what is their impact on, on, on democratic elections? Uh, thank you, Bonolo, and thank you for the question. Um, with regards to the second part of the question, yes, indeed, um, the coronavirus pandemic has brought um, a challenge in terms of international observers. And I believe it may not only be in the African case, but elsewhere as well. Um, in this particular case, um, observers would not have perhaps participated, but it's important to note that um, there is a role for international observers in elections in general. Um, obviously, they have to uh, ensure that um, the voting takes place in, in, in accordance to international standards and good practices. They also have a role in deterring integrity problems in terms of free and fair elections when they are contested. Um, and also they play a role in holding a fragile process together, as well as increasing the credibility and legitimacy of the electoral process. Um, in this particular case, because of the coronavirus um, in Malawi, for example, though invitations were sent out, obviously many countries that had stipulated states of emergencies and states of disasters um, initially closed their borders. So many countries um, that held their elections were not able to have international observers. But I guess in this particular case, that's where the role of national observers come into play. And fortunately, um, national observers such as uh, human rights organizations, faith-based organizations, as well as other civil society organizations were able to step in um, and play that role. So it's always important to consider the, the role that both international as well as local observers um, play. But um, international observers obviously need to abide by certain standards. For example, respecting the sovereignty of the host country as well as being objective to what um, they are seeing on the ground. And remember, an observer is doing exactly that. He's, he or she is just observing. So they cannot interfere in the election process. Um, they just need to ensure that the process has been accurate and, um, and that the results are as, um, as they ought to be. Therefore, um, observers need to avoid conflicts of interest and just ensure that the process is free and fair. Thank you. Um, in fact, on that, there's a comment here. Um, let me find it. There's a comment here from, from Dawn that in the case of Burundi, there is a widely held perception that the leadership of East African community, the Secretariat that is, is family in the camp of the Burundi ruling party. Um, so, so Don, I don't know if you want to come in here based on this comment it's, that you just made. Can we then accept the, 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 the offering that the elections in Burundi were free and fair considering um, the possibility that um, those that came in to observe the East African community may have been in, in the camp of, 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 of the then president. Don? Yeah, I mean, uh, I could proffer an opinion on that. It not be very authoritative, obviously, because we're also not on the ground in Burundi. But for me, it wasn't surprising that one of the very few uh, external observers allowed was the East African community. Uh, the current Secretary General of the East African community, Liberam Fumukeko, um, is somebody who has been widely perceived across the region, not just in Burundi, to be family in the camp of CNDD, FDD, the ruling party in Burundi. They are the ones that nominated him, obviously, for appointment to the East African community uh, secretary in the first place. 
but also just how he has conducted his business. He's blatantly partisan. And half the time when Burundi doesn't turn up for a meeting, he's the one that's giving the explanation and the justification why the Burundi government has not turned up for a meeting of the East African community. Yet he's supposed to be a neutral and impartial international civil servant. And he's also seen as somebody who helped frustrate uh, the peace talks that were being facilitated by Benjamin Kappa and uh, Burundi and civil society have written uh, lots of uh, uh, complaints, petitions and letters about that. So it wasn't surprising that they're the only ones who were allowed. But even more interesting is, well, they were allowed then with something like 12 days to voting, it may even be 10, I'm not sure, is when they get a formal not verbal from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Burundi saying that any member of the election observation mission that wants to participate in the elections should be aware that they will be subjected to the 14 day quarantine. Which means that even if they did fly in on the same day or drive in on the same day that they received the letter during voting and during counting that have been in quarantine. Mm. So literally it was just kind of a show to kind of say that we allowed you but we don't mean it. And if there were any Burundian members of the election observation mission who happened to be in Burundi already then maybe they would observe. In the circumstances, I'm not even sure that the ESC has issued a report of its election observation mission if it actually took one. But then you can see, I think it's the same thing Janelle was saying, um, that what we've seen with these states is that they appropriate the language of COVID and use it uh, to their convenience. So the same, same people that will tell you, God has saved us, we are an exceptional country, we don't have COVID. At the same same people say, no, 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 but if you want to come into my country, COVID is real, so therefore you need 14 days quarantine. Uh, but all other reports that we received uh, from uh, our counterparts who are on the ground is what it is a typical African election with double voting, triple voting, vote staffing, and so on. So people just accept it that, oh, well, we've got to accept it. But there's very little feeling in the region that there was uh, a, a credible election. Uh, the ground, of course, in advance was neither free nor fair, and there was no way of assuring credibility. It's not to say that it's uh, uh, external observers who give credibility to an election. They add to it if they can support it. Uh, yeah. That's what we saw in Malawi. But uh, even the people on the ground, many of whom may not want to be quoted, uh, are clear uh, that uh, this was a, a typical, you know, you know, contrived election. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, Nobutle, I have a question here for you. Um, someone here says the presentation was very captivating and informative. However, I want to know how can this be applicable in a country where the public does not elect members of parliament and government, but traditional clan leaders do instead? Okay, I think that's a very difficult question to answer, but I think in a in an environment where the traditional clan leaders essentially represent the political voice of the citizens, the election emergency laws would still have to be purpose driven. And so in that type of situation, perhaps because it's an, an emergency, um, perhaps an independent body such as an electoral commission could come in and facilitate the process and put together perhaps an expert team of people who know how best to deal with the emergency at hand. And within that expert team, perhaps you could also have actual citizens who would be represented and who would be allowed to also make decisions within that council. Um, yeah, so I think the power structure would definitely have to be changed a little bit, but essentially, I, I, I do think that it would have to be an independent body that would have to facilitate the process with the involvement of the actual citizens. Yeah, so, so, so and, and this, we, we're going to be talking about this extensively tomorrow, but considering that it has come up now based on your presentation, um, one of the, the questions that I've been asked here is that what, what your take would be on electronic voting as a strategy to respond to um, emergency situations. So, so you've provided um, some strategic 
and, and given really good critical analysis on some of the ways in which that the commissions can employ um, in moments of crisis like COVID-19 and even in your reflection on the case of Liberia with Ebola and, and my, my home state in, in, in Northwest Putatswana during the, 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 the administration of President Manyana Mangope. But now because we, we have evolved and we live in a digital world, um, so this doesn't, that didn't come out in your presentation. And like I said, we're going to engage on it tomorrow in exploring um, feasible technological ways of, of running a democratic elections. Um, but would you, would you bring this as a, as a suggestion um, for electronic voting as a strategy, particularly during moments of, of emergency and, and national crisis? Well, I think electronic voting is known to be a very risky way of voting. Um, you know, I, I don't know much about it, but I know from the few stuff that I've read that even in places where it has been tested, there's always been someone out there who's been able to hack the system somehow. And so because I don't think it's a very reliable system of voting, I don't think it would be beneficial to implement electronic voting in an emergency situation, especially if it would be implemented for the first time in that particular um, society. I think the, the correct infrastructure needs to be in place in terms of safety and um, accounting for all the cyber risks and a lot of societies including South Africa I think we're very far from actually creating a, a state, an infrastructure that we can all safely rely upon I mean even we have banks that are being hacked you know which is a crazy situation so I think in, a, in an emergency I, I wouldn't necessarily say that electronic voting would be a, a good strategy to take on but maybe it would be useful to sort of digitize certain other um, activities that are associated with the voting process. For example, um, voter registration, um, maybe taking down the addresses of people, I'm not really sure, but perhaps digitizing those types of activities could be beneficial and could help in um, creating an effective electoral system. But voting, I definitely think we have a very long way to go before we can start to vote electronically. But I also think one of the things to consider on that, and I'm not an expert in the subject and we'll have a conversation about it tomorrow. I think particularly within the African context um, with our socioeconomic and socio-political situations, um, mm. electronic voting might, might be exclusionary to a certain population that does not have access to, to, to technology. I mean, um, and there's, there's, there's literacy issues, um, there's no stable ICT, and so, but it, it's not something that could completely be written off. I think it's an alternative to be explored, um, but considering some of the socioeconomic and sociopolitical um, situations and contexts around Africa, um, it might be something that could happen in the future. Janelle, I, you alluded to it in your conclusion. I don't know if you want to come in here. Um, thanks, Bonolo. I, I agree with you. I think um, at the end of the day, as I said, um, the current situation on the continent may not be conducive for that. Um, it's very crucial that there is an enabling environment and that includes, as you said, the social economic, the political, as well as the legal environment. So there definitely needs to be more work done um, in order to, to assure that other options are explored. Um, and I guess that's why uh, conferences like these are important because we then have to uh, have brainstorming sessions to think about how will the future of elections look in Africa and what needs to be done today so that uh, in five years or 10 years time, those options are possible. And of course, in extraordinary circumstances such as pandemics, maybe tomorrow it won't be um, Corona, maybe it will be another pandemic. So how should we prepare ourselves now in order for us to have free and fair elections in the years to come? Thank you, Janelle. Just before I give each of you a moment to give your final remarks, um, 
there's a question here to Tina Tenda, and I'm going to read her response in case somebody has may have missed it. Uh, the question goes to Tina Tenda. COVID-19 for a short period of time made uh, political parties put aside their different ideologies. Oh, this sounds like it's repeating a question I asked earlier. Has the pandemic been politicized to curb the activities of opposition political parties? If not, what measures were taken by all relevant stakeholders to ensure that this did not happen? Um, Tino Tenda then says here, I'm not aware of attempts by any of the political parties to marginalize the activities of another party. If anything, most opposition parties have been able to make use of social media um, and judicial system to address any flaws with the, with the lockdown um, restrictions. Um, so just for a few minutes, uh, maybe two minutes each, I'm going to hand over to Nobutle and uh, Janelle. Uh, Tino Tenda, I don't know if your internet is a little bit better for you to give your, your final remarks. And then we end off this session as we prepare for the next one. Um, Nobutle. Um, yeah, so I mean, moving forward, we all know that um, next week the by-elections are set to take place. And um, I'm sure a lot of us will be watching in anticipation to see how this plan actually works out because the Electoral Commission did decide that it's going to hold all the elections simultaneously. And I think, you know, this was a form of damage control in order to make up for what was possibly a mistake, but the results will show when the election results um, come out, we'll, we'll actually be able to see whether the postponement was worth it or not. But I definitely think that the Electoral Commission needs to have serious discussions with um, people, regular people and experts and people who are interested in improving the electoral system about how we can act better in the next, um, in the next election crisis. Um, as Janelle said, it, it may not be, it may be coronavirus today, but tomorrow it's going to be another crisis. And we need to make sure that we take the lessons learned from this, from this current virus um, and that we can adequately um, implement a, a better strategy next time. And in doing that, I also think that the Electoral Commission needs to ensure that it cooperates properly with other government departments as it states in its plan, which it completely neglected to do during this crisis. But I think cooperation between state bodies and stakeholders will actually help to create a much better response. Thank you. Thank you, Nobutle. Janelle? Um, my last comments, I think I would just um, resonates again, the fact that whether we're in a pandemic or not, we need to ensure that um, elections in Africa do not have the same challenges that we've had over the last 50, 60 years. I mean, questions of violent electoral contestations, credibility issues, organizational and administrative problems, as well as autocratic tendencies. These are uh, things that we need to deal with even when they are ordinary circumstances because they become even more complicated uh, during extraordinary circumstances. And on the point of credibility, I mean, um, yesterday the results of Cote d'Ivoire's elections came out and um, the present president was re-elected for a third term with 94.27% of the vote. Um, you know, this is, a, it's, a, it's a questionable um, outcome, but um, ultimately in a case of, um, in the case of Burundi and Malawi, we see how the government's responses to the virus ultimately impacted how um, they decided to proceed with their elections. So it's, it's always important that um, different aspects are taken into account when elections are held, but we need to hold on to the principles of electoral democracy, which include uh, free and fair elections, as well as ensuring that um, the elections are credible. Thank you, Janelle. Uh, Tino Tenda. Um, thank you. I think from my very short presentation, I'd just like to end off by saying that 
the electorate is increasingly evaluating political parties based on their current um, performance records. It follows that their responses during this pandemic will be a noteworthy consideration for the electorate when it comes um, local government election time. So this could be a time for really any party to really harness the situation and um, take control of government in, in, in the uh, not only in the, um, in the local government elections, but possibly in the national government elections as well. Thank you. Um, thank you to all three of you for your presentations. Um, a lot of valuable um, conversations and discussions have come up. We, we are going to end off this session um, and then we have another session coming up, but it's a short session. So we promise we won't keep you long. It's a short session between two, two and, and three, just for one hour. So we'll in, we are encouraging you to come back at two o'clock South African time, which will be if there are any participants from um, East Africa, that will be three o'clock your time. West Africans would be 12 o'clock and one o'clock respectively your time. Um, so we're looking forward to seeing you at our next session. And that session in particular will focus on local government in, in, in South Africa. We'll look at um, the Johannesburg municipality in particular at multi-party arrangements there and what that look like, what that would look like for them in the 2021 upcoming local government elections amid COVID-19. And then we go in to also look at a presentation by Mr. Honor Litzela on how COVID-19 has affected the electoral processes. Again, the case of South Africa's by-elections and local government elections. And Nobuta noted this, I think next week on the 11th of November, we, we are having, we are having by-elections. So it will be interesting to engage on that as we predict what, what, where, what will that look like and what will the, where will those elections land? So thank you very much, um, everyone who has participated. As I noted earlier, this was um, recorded and it will be placed on the center's website and social media, but it is also, um, was been live streamed on Facebook. So if you wanna go back and, in, and, and, and look through this conversation, you can access it from, from, from Facebook. So we'll meet again in the next hour and 30 minutes please use the, the same link that you used um, joining in this in this meeting. Thanks everyone, um, see you soon in the next hour and 30 minutes. Hello, um, Magela, before you close, I just wanted to ask a question, if you don't mind. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, yeah, um, my name is Farah uh, from Somalia and I just wanted to uh, ask a question, and I may not be able to join uh, the afternoon uh, session. So if you don't mind, and then and, uh, to say thank you to the, the panels and uh, the discussions were uh, fruitful, and I really liked the analysis. And uh, I am from Somalia, a country that has been uh, in a state of uh, uh, ANIC for uh, 30 years and then uh, now there was a plan of having uh, elections in the country for the first uh, time for 30 years uh, but that did not uh, is not going to happen now because of so many factors related with security related with uh, in, uh, still a political uh, conflict uh, existing and now uh, the election is going to be managed by uh, clan elders who will uh, select uh, the members of parliament. So uh, in such case, then, uh, is there a way and uh, these discussions will be help, helpful in ensuring that the voice of, uh, of the public is heard and then uh, through using advocacy. So I just wanted to ask that and uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the presenters and the other uh, audience in the in the in the conference, and uh, I say thank you. Janelle, do you want to speak to that? Uh, thank you, Farah, for for your point. I think um, it's it's well noted by all, and I think that um, 
conferences such as these are very important in order to, to, to um, generate ideas on what should be um, the norm, particularly um, in Africa. I think the points that you raised is very important and I would uh, request that you kindly come back for the session in the afternoon and even tomorrow's session, I think that uh, the speakers will be able to provide some sort of parameters um, which could be relevant to the context in Somalia. Thank you. Um, so yes, thank you again, everyone. Thank you to our presenters. Thank you to everyone that has put in comments and, and questions here. Um, I'm just gonna read something quickly from Don. He says here, I think it's difficult. It's a difficult situation that our comrades from Somalia find themselves in. The constitu constitutional arrangements were negotiated outside the country in Kenya. Um, ordinary people were not sufficiently involved or informed. Um, this could be a question to take to the African Commission on Human and People's Rights or the court um, in the context of Article 13 of the, of the African Charter. Um, thank you for, for this comment, Don. So um, yeah, thank you everyone. We're going to see you in the next hour and 30 minutes. And as I noted earlier, please would you use the same um, meeting link that you used earlier and hopefully we'll see you later um, for another hour session. Thank you, have a great afternoon. Thank you.